Well, today we're looking at the two different types of data or data. I don't know how you want to say that, whether you're American or not. And we're looking at why you might even care that there's two different types of data. So let me straight on up tell you what the two different types of data are. The first type is categorical. I'll write that down. Categorical data. Categorical data is data that it comes from categories and there's multiple different types of it. Uh, for example, uh, types of soft drink. Types of soft drink. So you might, uh, you know, do a survey, ask the class, uh, or, or you might look at a machine and look at what types of soft drinks are sold out of the machine each day. And there might be uh, Coke and there might be Sprite and there might be Fanta. Uh, there might be different types and different numbers of, of cans of each of those that are sold. So it's legitimate data, but it's under the heading categorical data because that type of data is data that comes in categories. And we're gonna talk about why it matters that you would know that. The other type of data um, that you might have, and I'll just move uh, down the page a little bit here. The other type of data, is numerical data, numerical. Numerical data such as, um, okay, you do a multiple choice quiz, um, the results in a 20 question multiple choice quiz. All right, now there's only one type of data there your result, like you might get zero, you might get one, you might get two, hopefully you get 20 or 18, 19 or 20, but that's only one type of thing there, like your result. Whereas with the categorical, there's different types of drinks in the soft drinks or um, uh, what about eye color? That would be putting things in categories. There's different types of eye color. So if you collect data on that, that's categorical data. Or um, so, so often surveys uh, give results that are categorical. Um, you know, here's a survey. Do you like SCOMO? Yes or no, right? Um, the results of a survey where you're going yes, or no, right? That is going to be categories. You're either in the category yes or the category no, but it's kind of two different types of thing. And you're not going to average that out and go, oh, someone's sort of halfway in the category of yes, no. Well, we'll talk about later how people do start to put numbers to categories. Um, but you can see that types of soft drink or eye color or, or the results of some type of survey where you need to um, say the extent to which you agree or disagree with something, that's all categories. Whereas numerical data, like the results in a 20 question um, uh, multiple choice quiz, uh, the time taken to run say 200 meters, that is just like time is the one item of data it's not like a whole lot of different types of drinks or something it's time that you're talking about but that that bit of data that uh, item could be any that variable could be any particular number couldn't it um what about stopping distance of cars okay that's all numerical data it's numbers rather than categories Right now, categorical data. Sometimes you might see people call it uh, qualitative data, and uh, numerical data, quantitative data. That's your uh, you're also known as situation. But where uh, right through to the HSC, you're going to refer to it as categorical and numerical data. Those two different types. Now we can break those types into two further types each. So of the categorical data, there are two different types. And of the numerical data, there's two different types that we can further break it down into. 
So the categorical data can just be names of things. Like I, I said uh, in that past example, I think we looked at eye colour. Um, the categorical data can just be names of things, but we call it nominal. We know that uh, that comes from the Latin word, uh, which also you see in other languages, that nom part of it for name. And the um, other type of categorical data is ordinal data, which, yes, it has some type of order to it, some inherent order, whereas names are just names. Uh, for example, uh, nominal categorical data, I'll give you a new one that we haven't used yet, uh, types of uh, public transport. <clears throat> types of public transport, such as you might go on a train or a bus or a ferry or a tram. Um, there's no real order to that. Like none of one, it's not like one of them has to be before the other in uh, representation. They're just, they're just types. Hair color is just types of colors of hair. Eye color is just, you know, it's just categories. Um, you might even look at types of cars. Isuzu, Toyota, Mazda, how many people bought each one, but there's no, um, there's no order to it. They're just categories. Right? But sometimes the categories, there is some type of inherent order. Um, so maybe a school year level. So when you're collecting, uh, you know, I'm looking at uh, as the girls walk through the gate down the bottom of Stanley Street, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing down which year level each one came through and collecting that data. And it turned out that there were uh, 13 year sevens and there were uh, uh, 80 year nines and there were 15 year 12s. So they're in categories because it's just what year group they're in, the different categories. Might as well be calling them different colours. But there is some kind of inherent order to that you know, year seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And if you were to go and uh, present that data on some sort of uh, pie chart or something, you would want to have it probably ranging from seven through to 12 or on some sort of column graph or, you know, it'd make sense to go seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 along the bottom of your graph. So sometimes it's categories, but there is some sort of uh, inherent order in behind that. Uh, what's another example of that? Oh. Um, when you do a survey, um, uh, sometimes you're asked uh, to indicate the extent to which you agree with something. So there's some kind of order in that. Like, what's the extent to which you agree with uh, the statement, Mr. Day is a genius, all right? You might, uh, you might disagree. You might uh, be neutral. You might agree. Uh, or you might strongly agree, or you might strongly disagree. Now, they're just categories, but there is some kind of order to them. And if you're gonna go and present that in some way, you'd present it with that kind of inherent order hovering around in the background. So it's kind of, it's categorical data, but you might call it ordinal. Whereas just types of public transport or eye color or, uh, the uses of the internet. There's no order to that. You know, by uses of the internet, I might be talking about, you know, email or uh, social media, uh, watching Netflix, uh, shopping. All right, the various ways you might use the internet. There's no underlying order. They're just categories of how you might use it. So that would be nominal. It'd be categorical data, but if you further want to, like, you know, name that more specifically, it's nominal categorical data. Categorical, nominal, or categorical, ordinal. All right, now with the numerical data, there's two types as well. There's your discrete data and your continuous data. And Really, we're going to spend a lot of time on that in year 11 and, and particularly in year 12. Uh, it makes a big difference to know if something's discrete or continuous. It makes a big difference. So 
discrete data, I'll put it right out there now, it is data that can be counted. Whereas continuous data is data that can be measured. Now, remember, we've already categorized it as numerical, right? So yeah, it's about numbers rather than categories. And it's one type of data of which you could get a certain number of that type. If you can count it up, it's discrete. But if, uh, <clears throat> if you have to measure it, it'll be continuous. That's the, that's the easiest way to put it. So for example, uh, discrete data, you might say the uh, number of goals scored in a soccer game. or in a series of soccer games over the season. But basically, that data can only be certain things. It can be zero or one or two or three or four or five. There's an infinite number of those things, but you can't score 1.5 goals in a soccer game. You can't score 1.2 or 2.7. You can only score zero, one, two, three, four. When it has to be certain things, and basically you count up those things, you've got yourself discrete data. Whereas continuous data, maybe uh, something like, well, it's something you measure, so heights and weights, and, um, the lengths, um, the amount of, right, amount of rainfall, there you go. The amount of rainfall would be continuous. Uh, what about uh, um, the heights of 15-year-old girls in New South Wales. You'd have to go out and measure those heights, and they could be anything. So with the discrete data, it can't be anything. You know, like I said, you can't get 1.7 goals in a soccer game. You can't have 3.6 children in a family. You, your family, if you're looking at the number of pets in your family, you can't have 5.9. You know, it's whole numbers. So that's discrete data. Continuous data could be anything. The amount of rainfall could be anything. You need to measure it, find out what it is. And the heights of 15-year-old girls in New South Wales could be anything. So you need to measure it. Now, some people will go, oh, it can't be anything. Like, you know, it's going to, the rainfall is going to measure to be 20 millimetres or 21 millimetres or 22. That's the problem of the measuring instrument, isn't it? Like, if you had an accurate enough measuring instrument, you could measure more and more and more and more accurately, and it could be any of any infinite number of possible measurements, right? So basically, if you're measuring something, it's going to be continuous data. It's already under the category numerical, but when you further break those down into their two separate types, discrete, you count, and continuous, you measure. All right. <clears throat> so why does the type of data matter? Well, first of all, over the years, uh, uh, you've looked at different ways of representing information in graphs. And in particular, we're going to be representing data. And some graphs are not suited and really uh, don't make sense when you do some types of data with them. And some graphs are better suited to different types of data. So when you represent data, you need to know what type it is so you know what graph you're going to use. So um, I would say that um, if you've got categorical data, because it's just categories that you've got, you want to show how all your data is um, represented by the different categories. So something like a, a sector graph, uh, some people also know that as a pie chart, would be good for categorical data. So, um, you know, if you're looking at different eye colour, you might have uh, blue and brown, and, you know, you might have some less lesser known ones like uh, grey maybe and green. But you, you can see how the whole is broken up there in the one look at it. And it kind of doesn't matter. I could put any of those sectors in any part of like that. I didn't have to have brown next to blue. It could have been between gray and green. It wouldn't have mattered, would it? So 
a, a sector graph is quite good. And, and another type of sector graph, I guess, is a divided bar graph where you basically take that sector graph and you make it one long bar. Not, not like a sheet that goes bar like that, not, not a long bar like that, but maybe a, a long bar like, you know, there's the entirety of the information and, you know, brown eyes might make up that much and blue eyes might now make up that next piece there, you know, which you might colour a different way. And then you might have green eyes and then you might have grey eyes there. So it, it shows you with a bar how, bar how it's made up. Okay, so um, you also, you know, might use some type of what we call a column graph. Now, um, I'll just write that here. A column graph can also be known as a bar graph, but not a divided bar graph. Yeah, it's a series of bars that makes it up. It could be horizontal, it could be vertical, it doesn't matter. But when you have a column graph, you know, about, uh, you know, this might be the, uh, the eye colour, uh, and this might be the frequency, the number of people that had that eye colour, you know, going up there. And uh, this could be uh, blue, and then this could be uh, brown, and then this could be grey sort of thing. And you just put individual columns. Now, the thing about that is it doesn't matter what order you put those columns in. I could put brown first and then blue and then grey. I could have changed the order around. It's not a matter. It's not a mess much. I'm, I'm perfectly in my rights to do that and make total sense. So on another day, that same information might be drawn with the, uh, the brown one first and uh, then the blue one and then the grey one down there. Column graph, bar graph sort of thing, and not a problem. And someone else might decide to draw them going across that way, you know, brown and blue and grey, and have the markings going up that way sort of thing. But you can represent categorical data with a sector graph or a divided bar graph, bar graph or a bar graph that's a column graph with individual columns. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but when you have discrete, uh, sorry, it could be discrete, but when you have numerical data, you can have a variety more graphs that you could use to represent it. Uh, things now like a histogram, which I'm going to come and talk about in a moment, a histogram. It's a column graph, but the columns have to be next to each other. And the order that they go in matters. And uh, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But that's a common, common um, type of representation of numerical data, a histogram. Uh, you could have a dot plot. You could have a stem and leaf plot. And these are all in this topic that we're going to do. You could have a box and whisker plot. Um, uh, you could have a, uh, oh, a line graph. Now, a line graph would be um, useful for continuous data because it represents every possibility, right? You wouldn't use a line graph for discrete data. Now, we're going to talk about this as time goes on. Like, you're, not, you're not expected to know all these types of graphs and which ones to use them for, but you've got to use your common sense. And we're going to talk about how your common sense might help you determine what to use. Uh, for example, when you've learned about box and whisker plots, you're going to discover that they're made up of finding things to do with the, the dispersion or spread out of the data. So you need to be able to find the median and you need to be able to find the, the lower quartile and the upper quartile and so on that you'll find out. But these measures, you can't do them with categorical data. So you wouldn't be able to make a box and whisker plot with categorical data. So you've got to look at what measures you can actually use on the data. And that'll help you also remember what representations are appropriate. So um, just a quick question before I, before I continue with uh, why, just about columns. Can you move the columns 
on this graph here and still have it make sense. I mean, you could. You could decide I want to put the biggest one first and move it through to the smallest one. So you could grab that yellow one, throw it over there and bump everything along to the right, couldn't you? And who cares if it went yellow, red, blue, green? Someone else might say, no, I'm going to do it alphabetically. So I'm going to have uh, blue first, then green, and then pink, red, yellow going along. That, hey, who can argue with that? Someone else might say, no, I'm going to do it by the colours of the spectrum. You know, red, uh, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, whatever the, whatever the colours of the spectrum are. I'm going to organise those colours. The point is, you could move a column and it would make sense. Right? And that's an example of a, a column graph as in a uh, just a normal sort of bar graph, I guess, um, where the columns don't have to be next to each other. It's not a histogram. Whereas if we look at this next picture, this is a histogram. So this one was about ice creams. You know, this, uh, this girl went out with her mother to sell ice creams at the beach and she decided to do a, a count of the ages of the children that came to collect ice creams over a certain period of time. You can see there were no one-year-olds. Maybe the parents were still at that point where um, uh, the children hadn't learned about ice creams uh, or uh, the child wasn't old enough to, to speak and nag the parent about ice creams. Uh, but you can see once they get a bit older, there's more children turning up for ice creams. You know, when at an age of six, there were six children turned up at an age of eight, there were three children turned up to get an ice cream, but only one nine-year-old, if you look at that graph. All right, but the original question stands. That, that's a histogram. Uh, and the columns are all next to each other. That's one difference between just any old column graph. But also, you can't change the order of the columns. Wouldn't it be ridiculous to turn it around and go, let's have the columns uh, go from the biggest to the smallest. So we'll have, um, you know, the bottom, you'd be setting it up. So you'd be going a uh, seven, it's the biggest, then uh, six, then uh, five, then uh, you'd have eight and uh, four, and uh, then you'd have three and maybe nine and one. How ridiculous to have that going along the bottom of your, your axes. Now, there's more reasons than just the commonsensical ridiculousness as well, we're going to learn that when you do a cumulative frequency histogram and then start to extract information from there by analysing it in terms of like the median, you can't have all the columns rearranged out of order like this one would be if I continued with it. You won't get a, a correct reading for the median. It, it, it won't work. The type of graph won't work. So common sense tells you that you can't move the columns around. That graph is, is suited to um, what type of data? Numerical data, right? Uh, whereas the top one there, well, that's a type of categorical data. You could move the columns and it wouldn't make any difference. All right, okay, so this is, this is under the heading why. Why, do, why does it matter? Well, you've got to choose the right representation of your data, but also... There's certain summary statistics, you know, when you analyse the data that you can, you can do on um, uh, numerical data that you can't do on categorical data. And I'm just going to fill in this table now, then go have a discussion about it. So you've got the information just right out there. Can you find the mean of categorical data? No, you can't. Although I will put a little asterisk here. You know, um, sometimes we assign... Uh, values to, um, to, to data gained from surveys. And make meaningful numerical calculations. They're not a proper mean, but um, they do mean something. For example, um, for example, say you had a survey that said uh, you've got uh, one, two, three, four, and five, and they had to circle it. And this is that you were neutral, and this is you know the, 
is Mr. Day a genius? You know, what do you do? You agree or do you disagree? So this is agree. This is strongly agree. Um, this is disagree here. And this is strongly disagree at the end. All right. Now, you could assign those numbers to it and then you could kind of average out the numbers. And if you averaged out all the numbers you got when you assigned numbers to those categories in that categorical data, you might be able to average out the numbers so you feel like you're finding the mean and the number might be like, say, uh, 4.5. Well, that's telling you something meaningful because it's telling you that the data is sort of skewed up towards the agreement side. Of course it is, and Mr. Day's a genius, so it would be agreement, but it's skewed up towards that end. So by doing those calculations, they're meaningful. It's not silly to do them, but it's not a true mean. You know, what is the mean of strongly agree, disagree, neutral, agree, and strongly agree? Strongly agree, uh, agree 0.5, is that a mean? Like, you know what I mean? You can't get a mean of categorical data, but sometimes people assign numbers to it and do some meaningful calculations, right? So that I put that little asterisk up in there to say, well, it's not stupid to try and do some calculations and actually do averaging of numbers with some types of categorical data, but it's not really a mean. And you're not really finding the mean for it, but you can with numerical data. You can find the median, with numerical, but it would be silly for categorical. You can find the mode for categorical data, like, like um, because the mode is the most common. So I guess even though there's different types of data with your soft drinks, there's different types of soft drinks, Coke and Fanta and lemonade, you can find the most popular one. And, and mode being a fashion word for, um, uh, for popularity, you know, it would make sense to find the mode of categorical data. You certainly can find the mode of numerical data. You can find the range of numerical data. How can you find the range of categorical data? Like, um, you know, you've got uh, different types of cars. You went out on the street and you counted up how many of the different types went past and there was some Isuzus and there was some BMWs and some Range Rovers, there was some Mazdas, there was some Toyotas. How can you find the range? What range? But if there's one type of data that you've got, like the number of pets in a family, right? You're counting up that number. It could be zero, one, two, three, four, five, for example. Then the number ranged from zero up to five. So you can kind of get a range or you can get a range from that. And the shape and the skew of the data. Once again, I would say with numerical data, you could plot it on a stem and leaf plot or some sort of uh, histogram and you could see the shape of the data whether it's symmetrical or whether it moves to one side or the other which we're going to talk about later in this topic you can't really do that with um, categorical data although as with the example which i've asterisked below i guess uh, if it's ordinal like this data you could kind of see that most people are saying Mr. Day is uh, a genius. So most of the data is skewed up towards the agreement end. So there could be an argument for skew and shape there, um, but it's really mostly valid for the numerical data. All right, now, I said we talked this through a little bit more. Can you find the mean, median, mode, and range of this data here? See, <laughs> Mr. Day's class voted on where they wanted to sit their trial exam. This was my year 12 class this year. I said, well, do you want to sit it in room 13? And I said, I'm going to call that R. I'll just call that letter R. Because these, these are categories, right? Room 13 starts with R, right? Do you want to sit it in the library? L. Do you want to sit it in Cooper Hall? C. Or do you want to sit it in Kennedy Annex? K. And you can see there uh, that five people wanted to be in room 13, only one wanted the library, three wanted Cooper Hall and two wanted Kennedy Annex. And that was my, my class for year 12. So I've collected that data. What type of data is it? Yes, it's categorical data because you're just putting them in categories. How many for room 13? How many for, it might as well be types of cars, right? 
five people like BMWs, one person like Range Rover, three people like Mazdas, and two people like Isuzus. It, you know, it's just categories. But in this case, it happens to be rooms. Now, my question is, if I want to find, uh, say, the median of this data, how would I go about it? Well, I could arrange these, these rooms, the room data alphabetically. You know, Cooper Hall had three people, so I could go Cooper, Cooper, Cooper. And after that, uh, the library, it has one person, so it just gets an L. And then after that, H-I-J-K-L, actually Kennedy Annex was next. So I'll put that, mate, two Kennedy Annexes, then the library. And then there were um, five room 13s, one, two, three, four, five. If I arrange them alphabetically, right, <laughs> you know how people go about finding the median. You know, they, they go, um, how many scores here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. There's one in the middle. Um, so the library is the median. Um, what what is that supposed to mean? How in what way is the library the median? You know, if I um, asked all of you girls to line up from shortest to tallest, and I went along the row and to the middle person, right? That person would be the person with the middle height of the group. That's meaningful. When you arrange things from smallest to biggest, you can get the median out of it. But just because this is alphabetical, that doesn't mean it's from smallest to biggest. It's just categorical data. That's silly. But, I mean, who's to say I should have arranged it alphabetically? What about if I arranged it according to the frequency? Like room 13 was the most frequent. It had five. One, two, three, four, five. Right? The next frequent was Cooper Hall. One, two, three. Then Kennedy Annex. One, two. And then the library. In that case, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's one, two, three, four, five. Cooper Hall is the median. Like, what I'm saying is you can't do that. So can you find the median? No. It makes no sense for categorical data to try and find the median. And how am I going to find the mean of that data? Yeah, Am I going to add up those scores, uh, 11, and do what? Oh, well, there's one, two, three, four rooms. So 11 divided by four. Uh, mm, 11 divided by four, I get 2.75. Uh, so, 2.7, what, what, what does that number mean? It's a, no, you can't do that. That's silly. Yeah, you can find the mode. I, that has some sort of meaning. I would say that room 13 is the mode. It, and it doesn't matter what order you order things in. You're going to get those five room 13s. And can you find the range of the data? It's not a single piece of data. It's not like... Um, you're measuring the length of something, which can be zero all the way up to 100 sort of thing, or any number in that range. You, you, it's not ranging from zero to 100. This data is not ranging from anything to anything. So no. So um, that will help sort of shed some light on why I've filled that table in the way I have. And why you need to know in the long run what the different types of data are so you know how you can go about representing it and what sort of analysis makes sense for that data. And that's uh, the main thing that I wanted to get across in this lesson. So if you, if you know now from this lesson that there's two types of data, categorical and numerical, and each of them can be broken up into two extra sort of more specific types. Categorical has ordinal and nominal. And numerical has discrete and continuous. You're doing really well. And the prep tonight is just to be able to identify those types of data. And sometimes it's tricky. In fact, sometimes you can be looking at the same type of data 
but depending on the way you look at it, you might group it, for example, rather than just look at it individually, you might be looking at different types of data. And the exercise that you'll be doing um, for prep, which you'll find um, under this tile uh, for this lesson, will bring that information out and maybe we can discuss it more next time. So have a go at the, the prep, see if you can identify the data into the different types required. 